It's going to be sad not to say John chapter 8 anymore. We've been spending a lot of time in this chapter. We're going to finish up our study in John chapter 8 tonight. Thank you so much, worship team, for pulling it all together and making it happen. You guys are great. I don't know if we can turn up the lights a little bit more. That would help me. So I look forward to our whole worship band being back together sometime soon. And, of course, Pastor Craig being with us. But one of the things I look forward to is Andrew said that he was going to come and sing Waymaker. So I'm waiting for that to happen, Andrew. I'm looking forward to that. Well, if you're not at John chapter 8, get there. And we are going to do our last study starting in verse 48. And I entitled this, God With Us. And I just thought it was interesting. Usually that's a message you hear at Christmas time, right? It's talking about the prophecy in Isaiah, God with us. But there's no clear passage in the scripture where God is testifying that he is with us than in these last few verses of John 8. So let me pray for us uh, after we read John 8, 48 through 51. It says, Then the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. And we have been uh, in this passage at the Feast of Tabernacles for a long time, for many months. And we see that your son is being consistently and constantly barraged by the religious leaders. We see that he is doing an amazing job of honoring you and continuing, continuing to validate who he is, that he is God in human flesh. And I would ask tonight, Lord, as we close up this section of the scriptures, that you would make your heart known to your saints, that you would confirm the truth of who you are in this passage, and that we could go out in great boldness, knowing many more of the truths of Jesus through what we study tonight. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So through 10 different attacks by the scribes and Pharisees and religious leaders, they have come after Jesus in our discourse here over the last few months that we've gone through. Remember, it's the Feast of Tabernacles, a time of celebration, a time of great joy in Jerusalem. I remember that the woman caught in the very act of adultery started us all out and how he freed her and let her go. And then great, gave her this great command and opportunity to go and sin no more. That she was no longer condemned and that she could walk in newness of life. He freed her from any condemnation. And we began walking in that ourselves, knowing that our sin does not hold us back in our relationship with God. The only thing that would hold us back with having complete for having complete forgiveness is not believing in who Jesus is. And these religious leaders are going back and forth with Jesus, not believing in who he is, not willing to yield, not even for a moment, that Jesus is God. They believe they're on the right side, the correct side of this fight, by saying that Jesus is blaspheming, that he is somebody of ill repute, Remember when Craig taught on this two weeks ago, they said that he was born of fornication. This thing that had gone around for 30 years, that he, his mom was, uh, was um, a, a woman of ill repute, and that she had slept with so many Roman soldiers that they didn't even know who Jesus' father was. And here, once again, they're going to bring a slam in towards Jesus and his genealogy. So let's just back up one verse to John 8, 47. It says, 
this. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. So Jesus making a direct correlation to their relationship with God. Because you are not of God, you cannot hear the words of God. But we see in verse 48 of John 8, he says this, Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So once again, the religious response is to degrade him in regards of who his heritage is from, who he was born from, calling him a half-breed. Remember, the Samaritans were despised by the Jewish people. They wouldn't even go through the land of Samaria. So once again, they're coming after his mom. There's one thing to come after me, but to come after my mom, you're really going to get my dander up there. But Jesus holds his composure. So they come after him saying, you're a Samaritan, you're a half-breed. We don't know if your mom slept with a Samaritan man or with a Roman soldier, but you are not of Jewish heritage. And then to throw it in even worse, they call, they say that he's demon-possessed, that the origin of his speech is coming from Satan himself, from the demonic realm, that he is in no way anointed by God to speak such words. And this is something they've thrown at him uh, over the years of his ministry. We see this in Matthew 24. Uh, 12, 24. This is a slight that they keep on throwing out towards him. And it's a slight that comes out against us today. It says in Matthew 12, 24. Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So here they want to give Jesus his words that the origin comes from Beelzebub, the king of the demons. Claudia, you can advance one more slide there. And then in John 10, later we're going to see, it says, and as many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? So if they can't get him on the whole demonic realm, that the origin of his speech is from Satan or the king of the devils, they're going to say that he's a madman, that he's crazy. In Acts, this happened to Paul too. Whenever someone comes up against the words of the Lord, they immediately want to distinguish it as a, man, man, a madman's voice or one of demonic origin. In Acts 26, 24, it says, Now as he thus made his defense, speaking of Paul, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. And I don't know how your walk with the Lord has been in regards of your transition into Christianity and what you were like before and what kind of friends uh, you had back in the day before you came to be a Christian or even what your family thought of you before you were a Christian. But have you been attacked since you have become a Christian do they think that maybe you've become a madman or a mad woman? That too much learning or too much churchianity has made you kind of cuckoo? That you've kind of lost it, all this Jesus talk? Well, this is nothing new. This is what the world wants to do. They want to change what your voice is about and the origin of your voice and try to diminish that you're speaking on the Lord's behalf. But you could be confident that when you speak the word of God and you share your testimony, what Jesus has done in your life, that is the word of God and they will come against it. They came, they came against Jesus, calling him a half-breed, trying to take away who his true father was, calling, him, calling the author of his voice of that of a demon-possessed man, calling him crazy. But we know we're in good company with Jesus and with Paul. Well, let's continue on in John 8 as they, this discourse continues. And we see Jesus' composure here in our next slide. So Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. I think it's so interesting that 
Jesus is able to hold it together. You don't see him provoked in his response. You don't see him throw an attack at them and their heritage when he responds to this criticism. He says he does not have a demon. He says that he is honoring his father. He is showing that he is in exact relationship with his father as he should be. That they're walking step by step, hand in hand. Everything he does honors his father. In no way is he dishonoring his father, and his father honors him in all his words. And I really wish I could do that all the time, keep my composure, and not dishonor my father in heaven by misrepresenting him. We remember that Moses fell into that temptation, that he got angry at the people of God, and he dishonored God by making it seem like God was mad at the Israelites, and he struck the rock when God was not mad at the Israelites. He was merely supposed to speak to the rock, Moses was, and then water would come forth. But we all give in to this temptation from time to time, but we see that Jesus didn't hear. Didn't hear. He gave glory to the Father, and they, the Pharisees and scribes, were dishonoring him. Jesus came completely to give honor to God. He wasn't worried about his own glory. He is willing to hang on and do whatever God called him to do. And my encouragement to you is that sometimes we are not glorified in this life. It seems all we do is scrap, and it's kind of we're just hanging on for dear life. And when will God come through and glorify us? When will he show that we are true and on the right side of history? Well, it might not be in our lifetime, but he will validate each and every one of us that we are on the right side of God. He will bring glory to your name. Maybe not in this life, but in the life to come, you will live in the glory that God has provided for you. There's a great verse out of Philippians chapter 2. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So that's what Jesus would do to glorify the Father. And then ask God what you are to do to glorify him. Is it that you would live an ordinary life, be an ordinary believer, and just live each day for him? Not that you would have a magnificent pulpit or some grandiose ministry, but just you would be an ordinary Christian. I think often we have the desire to do great, uh, great things for the Lord. But sometimes he asks us just to survive, just to continue on, just to excel in the little ways and not to have a grand pulpit. But be content, as Jesus was content, all the way to the point of going to the cross, making himself of no reputation. That goes so often of our world today. Everything's about building a reputation. You know, what's your online persona? What's your reputation online? Well, you can know that God sees each and everything that you do for him, and he honors that. Well, let's continue in John chapter 8 and look at verse 51. So Jesus confirms that those who belong to him don't die. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Isn't that kind of a hard thing to compute? I mean, we've been going through two years of people concerned about death. And we're very aware, aware that this body will stop existing. In regards, it'll stop breathing. Blood will stop pop, uh, pumping through our veins. But what Jesus is saying here, that anybody who is in him, who believes in him, they will not die. This outside body, yes, it ceases, but you continue on. There's a promotion that will happen. There's no soul sleep. 
There's no big in-between time between here and eternity. No, our last breath here on earth will be our first breath in heaven. That's what Jesus is guaranteeing here, that you will never see death. And I was studying this before I got sick. And when I got sick, I really stood on this. I will not see death. Even if this body sees death, I will not see death. The people that I love who know the Lord, they will not see death. Death is being absent from our Father God. That is what death is, is not being in relationship with him in eternity and being separated from God's love and his grace. That is the definition of death. But none of us have to worry about that because we have Jesus. And when we're confirmed in this, remember in John 3, we're used to John 3, 16, but John 3, 14 and 15 says this very thing. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus told us in John 3, this is how it works. We look to Jesus who was lifted up, who became sin for us on that cross, and we will be healed. Our life is secure in him. In John 11, he spoke to the same subject matter. It says, Jesus said to her, speaking of Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And this was speaking of Lazarus and his release from the tomb. And I recently had a little conversation with a gentleman, and the question came up, what was Lazarus like after the resurrection? Do you think he was happy? Do you think he had a frown? I think he was the most excited man ever because he spent four days on the other side with Jesus. He knew exactly where he was going. And we're all fearful of death, not death itself, but the vehicle of our death. That's what really concerns us. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to somehow go through a very hor uh, uh, harmful suffering type transition into eternity. I do not want to be eaten by a shark to find out what eternal life is like. That does not sound good. But just this idea as Lazarus rose from the dead, I bet he said, I don't care how it comes. I'm ready for it to come again because it was so pure and so lovely. And I looked on my eternal father eye to eye, face to face. So I bet Lazarus was a really good guy to have at a party. A lot of fun to enjoy what eternity was like. Well, let's continue back into John 8, 52, 53. And the scribes and Pharisees, once again, they bring out Abraham as their solid position of who they were related to in regards of their salvation. It says, then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? So in that picture, that is the place where Abraham is buried. That is the tomb of Abraham that you find in Hebron. Two weeks ago, I threw out a question in regards to the cities of refuge. Uh, that in Joshua, we are going to talk about cities of refuge as that book closed out. And I asked the question, what my favorite city of refuge was? And my favorite city is Hebron. And I was blessed to go to Hebron and see the burial place of Abraham with my own eyes. And you know what? Abraham's body's there, but Abraham is not. And that's what these Jews were trying to impress upon Jesus. You are out of your mind. You have no idea what you're talking about. We have Abraham's tomb with us. We know that Abraham is dead. And Jesus is saying, he is not dead. He is alive. And this is 
talked about in the Gospel of Mark. It says this in Mark 12, 26 and 27. But concerning the dead, that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So Jesus in Mark and in John is trying to convince these men that are so fleshly minded that no, eternal life is true for all the patriarchs. Their bodies might be entombed, but they are alive with God in heaven. So remember, this is Jesus' activity all throughout the Gospel of John, trying to raise up their fleshly minds to get them into the spiritual mindset. But they refuse to go there. They refuse to elevate their minds into the spiritual reality that this isn't all that we are, the physical bodies and how we see one another. This is not all there is. Who you truly are is spiritual. Who you truly are is eternal. Well, back into John chapter 8, Jesus is going again to let them know that he is in, in a perfect alignment with his Father. It says, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Jesus, honoring his Father, doing nothing by his own compulsion, but what the Father tells him to do, he's in full autopilot with the Father, that the Father is one controlling his interactions with the world around him. He is in total communion with his God in heaven, his Father. And I love what he says here, that if he didn't do what his Father told him to do, he would be a liar like they are. This is what shows us that Jesus is a truth teller. Because whatever the Father tells the Son, the Son does and says. And if it wasn't exactly uh, dialed in to what the Father was doing, he would be a liar, he would be condemned of sin, and he could not be a Savior that could save us. But he is showing his perfection here by his words and his behavior, and he knows God the Father and does whatever is asked by the Father. Well, next we see in verse 56 and 57, this great response about Abraham. It says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus saying, you think you know who Abraham is. You never had any first reaction uh, interaction with Abraham like I have. You might have his blood flowing through you. You might, ha might have his genomes, his code in you, but I knew Abraham ahead of time, and Abraham knew me. He knew my day. And I always wondered what Jesus was trying to get across in regards of Abraham knowing the day of Jesus. And I think it has to do with Abraham's very introduction to the God of the universe. Remember that Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was an idol-worshiping Gentile. And then God showed up and said, I'm going to save you. I'm going to take you to a land that I am giving you. And that he even delayed for a period of time in Haran. And God showed up to Abraham and said, I'm going to take you into a promised land, and I'm going to make you a great people. God promised Abraham the land of Canaan, that he would live there, and the whole property would belong to him. The whole territory of Canaan would be his land, something that he had no right to, but God opened up Abraham's heart. And I believe that's the day that began for Abraham that he saw 
the day of Jesus. We also see that God promised Abram descendants. Remember that Abram was so old, 90 years old, and he had no descendants. How could this promise ever come? And he would still be waiting almost a decade before that true son of promise would come and do his life. But God was showing Abraham the day of Jesus. We also see in Genesis 17 that God changed Abram's name and gave him the covenant of circumcision. God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, the man of many descendants, and gave him circumcision as an outward sign of the righteousness that would be imparted to Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And this outward sign was given to identify himself as a person that was dedicated to God. Genesis 18, God warned Abraham about the, the suffering and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That when you're a friend of God, when you are in the light of Jesus and the knowledge of God, he warns you about things to come, like he did to Abraham, that Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed, that Lot and just his close relatives would escape that place. And God shares with his friends about what he's going to do before he does it. But I think the greatest in clarity of seeing the day of Jesus comes from the sacrifice of Isaac. Now let's see about how the Hebrew writer wrote this in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So the author of the book of Hebrews, this way that Abraham knew that resurrection would occur. Remember that Isaac was about a 30-year-old man or a 33-year-old man when he went up Mount Moriah, and he carried the sticks on his back. So he could have easily fought his father, but he went willingly to that place of sacrifice. And I just believe as Abraham was getting ready to plunge that knife into Isaac to sacrifice him and then burn him, that he knew that even from the ashes, God would bring him back. God would resurrect Isaac if necessary because of the promises were made to him. Let's read out of Genesis and what this looked like from Abraham's vantage point. It says, but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, I, uh, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And here we see that Abraham had such a vivid portrait, a vivid image of what God would do, that he would provide himself the sacrifice. That many years later on this same mountain, Mount Moriah, Jesus would be provided as the lamb to take away the sins of the world. Abraham saw Jesus' day and he was glad. So here we see that Jesus, he trumps all the Pharisees and the Sadducees because he was interacting with Abraham way back in the day before they were even a twinkle in the eyes of Abraham and the patriarchs. Jesus is truly the one who was before and who is and is the one to come. Well, let's get to that verse that we've been waiting for tonight. Verse 58, and Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus saying he is the great I am. In the Greek, it's the ego am I. 
And that's the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. So we have it in Greek, which is ego am I, the I am. And this time he's not holding any punches. Remember, we've heard the I am before, but he links it with something that they could try to identify with. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. In the future, he's going to talk about being the vine. I am the gatekeeper. But now he lays it out so clearly to them that he is the I am. And he's taking that right out of Exodus chapter 3, where we get the I am of the burning bush. Remember, Moses came to the burning bush, and it's a symbol of grace. It was a bush that was not consumed by fire. There's one thing to throw a Christmas tree on a fire pit and watch it go up. Well, take your month-and-a-half-year-old Christmas tree, put it in a fire pit, and not see it burn up. That's the miraculous part, that Moses came to this burning bush that should have been consumed, but grace was on top of it. It was not burned up. And Moses was saying, you're calling me to go on this great mission of releasing the, the Israelites from Egypt. But what can I tell them? What is your name? What can I say to them that they'll believe me? And this is the tetragrammaton that God gave to Moses. I am the YHWH where we get Yehovah or Yahweh. This is the name of God that's given over 6,800 times in the Old Testament to identify who he is. And he's the pre-existent one. It's not like he happened to just be there a generation before Abraham. No, he has always been there. He's the uncreated one. He's the ever-existent one. And Jesus is throwing this right in front of them, saying that I am. And many people will argue that Jesus never said that he was God in the Bible. Well, I'm telling you, he did. Right here, he called himself God. He called himself Jehovah God, that they would know clearly. And you know what? They received it that way because we see their response in the next verse. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So people might argue with you that Jesus never claimed to be God in the scriptures. Right here, you have a very specific instance where he did. And you know what? You could not argue with these Jews that Jesus was not saying that he was God. You can tell exactly by their response. They knew he was saying that he was Jehovah of the Old Testament because they're ready to kill him. They're ready to stone him for, to death because of blasphemy. But Jesus is who he says that he is, and then he slips away. We know he did this once before in Nazareth. He was able to make his way out of there. I don't know exactly how that worked. He kind of just blended in behind Peter. Or John, he kind of just snuck out. But for whatever reason, his time had not come. So he passed out of the temple, and that ends this debate with these scribes and Pharisees. But instead of bowing the knee, believing in him, they decided to, go, to continue on in their mission to kill Jesus. And we're going to see how that continues to manifest through the Gospel of John. Well, let me close with a final quote from Spurgeon. It just makes so much sense in regards of who we are as Christians. It says, if Christ was not God, we are not Christians. We are deceived dupes. We are idolaters, as bad as the heathen whom we now pity. It is making a man into a God if Christ be not God. And I know that you guys believe in who Jesus is. But you're compelled by the Spirit to let others know who he is. And even if they were to call you crazy, 
demon possessed, some sort of you know, weird half breed or something, grab on to that call of letting the world know who Jesus truly is. He is the I am. He is God the Father of the Old Testament. He is the very manifest, manifestation of God. Don't back down. Know that he will honor you. He will glorify each one of us in heaven because we stood firm for him. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus' ability to stay consistent in his message and his word. Lord, that he didn't get flustered by the attacks. Oh, we're so easily fired up and flustered. But he was not. He stayed on task. He perfectly represented his father. Every word the father gave him, he said. Every action the father told him to do, he did. And he was able to stand there in absolute truth and righteousness and say that I am. And we're thankful for that because we believe in who he is. We will never taste death. We will transition from this life to the next, but we will never taste death. We will always be in the house of the Lord. So bless your word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.